Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Wednesdays at the Center, hosted by the John Hope Franklin Center and Duke University Center for International and Global Studies. Today, we are pleased to welcome Jackson Ewing, a senior fellow at Duke University's Nicholas Institute of Environmental Policy Solutions and an adjunct associate professor at the Sanford School of Public Policy. The talk and following Q&A will be moderated by our director, Professor Giovanni Zanalda. Please remember to keep your microphone muted and to submit questions and comments in the chat. Please let us welcome Professor Giovanni Zanalda. Thank you, Aini, and thank you to all the attendees for being here with us today. And uh, thank you in particular to Jackson Ewing, uh, who is not only a great scholar and expert uh, uh, in the subject that we are going to talk about today, but is also a good friend and uh, really happy that we, uh, be, we managed to have this event uh, together today. Um, Professor Ewing will uh, uh, provide some initial remarks with uh, also the help of slides. And uh, after that, we will uh, ask questions I will ask one or two questions and then I will uh, go through the chat room to uh, redirect uh, questions from the audience. Um, I want just to say that uh, uh, thanks to Jackson, this is a timely topic. It, was, it has been timely for a while, but every week there is something new. So I think that we could have uh, a sequel uh, because uh, China, the US, uh, Europe and other countries and other regions of the world are involved in this uh, big game of uh, infrastructure. So uh, Jackson, thank you very much. And uh, please, um, we will, uh, I'm sure we will ask you a lot of questions, but uh, first let us know what you would like to tell us and where we are right now in the world about infrastructures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giovanni, and thank you to the entire DCIS and Franklin Center teams for giving me this platform. I greatly enjoy Wednesdays at the Center as a consumer and am proud to have been able to be part of this series as a speaker on a couple of occasions and certainly hope to continue to do so in the future. Last Tuesday, President Xi of China in a recorded address to the UN General Assembly stated, among other things, that China will step up support for other developing countries in developing green and low carbon energy and will not build new coal-fired power projects abroad. This is the second year in a row that President Xi has set off fireworks at the UNGA meetings following on the Chinese pronouncements last year that it would seek to peak its own domestic carbon emissions before 2030, its previous target, and perhaps uh, more importantly, and certainly more uh, attention grabbing uh, in that announcement was the declaration that China would achieve carbon neutrality across its economy by 2060, 10 years after the target date of many Western countries and some of its East Asian peers. Uh, but still, for a developing country of China's magnitude with its influence over the global trajectory of, of uh, climate change causing emissions, both of these statements uh, have really reset some of the goalposts uh, in the international effort to keep our global temperature increases below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels with every effort to keep that temperature to 1.5 degrees. So during the next 15 to 20 minutes, I will seek to go through some of the reasons why this latest pronouncement by President Xi is particularly important, namely the outsized role that China had come to occupy in international fossil fuel and particularly coal finance in developing uh, low and middle income countries over the last decade and a half. Um, I will then try to expand on some of the forces both behind that role uh, as well as their implications and, and round out into offering a few thoughts on why 
that uh, reversal was made possible through some dwindling and reprioritize dwindling of, of fossil fuel intensive investment from China and uh, a reprioritization of how uh, it would deploy some of its international financial uh, resources and the tools that it was using to, to use them. We'll then shift gears to look at the competitive landscape in infrastructure development in the developing world, which is embedded in the title of this talk, and specifically look to ways in which uh, US-led efforts through the G7, including notably um, a shifts in policy from Japan, as well as a very recently, also almost real-time declaration from the EU, are seeking to uh, fairly explicitly create competing infrastructure, architect infrastructure investment architectures. Uh, and we can conclude with a discussion on the differences in the characteristics of the Chinese approaches from these G7 and EU projects, um, as well as some speculation about the future competition among these great powers, which is where I hope that our discussion will largely reside. First, let's look at this really uh, meteoric rise in China's investment growth. Um, you'll see on the left side of this slide, the international development finance from China compared to G7 countries during uh, slightly more than the first half of the, of the two decades of the, the 21st century, um, with the United States outstripping China um, and some degree of parity uh, compared to some of the G7 peers. Uh, compared to the domination of China in this realm from 2013, when its Belt and Road Initiative was launched, until 2017. Uh, you'll see the dark green. Um, you'll also see some fundamental differences in the characteristics of this finance, which I'll get into in more detail. To simply explain those acronyms, however, um, we see the United States being dominated by overseas development assistance, uh, while the Chinese um, uh, investment being geared towards uh, other flows, um, other outbound investment flows, which include private uh, loans, uh, you know, strategic partnerships, et cetera. Um, everything defined by the OECD as not having any more than 25% of, uh, of grants within its portfolio. Um, so differences in characteristics and massive changes in the makeup uh, and the uh, quantities of resources being deployed. So what's behind this? Um, on the domestic side, we see a convergence of three main factors. One is an oversupply of foreign currency, looking for destinations at which it can find some return, uh, high levels of industrial overproduction, uh, particularly that which relates to expansive industrial gains in steel, cement, and other construction sectors in China, as well as, as we'll see in the energy sector, and a continual need to secure natural resources um, that China lacks in sufficient quantities at home. So a convergence of resource extraction goals from China um, and a desire to defray some of its overcapacity through construction um, in select uh, low and middle income countries. Um, so in response, China has begun and, and continues to do um, in this post BRI, post 2013 period, to ramp up dollar and euro denominated lending at near market rates, uh, but it's also contractually obligating many of its overseas borrowers to source project inputs, such as steel and cement, again, from China itself, and in many instances, uh, contracts them to absorb Chinese labor forces as well. Um, it also allows uh, many of these countries to secure and repay loans with money they earn from natural resource exports to China. And as I'll mention in a little bit more detail here momentarily, actually, uses the um, possibility or the scenario of such resource extraction and export to China as a way to collateralize some of these financial arrangements. Um, the data that you see here, and I'm going to linger on this for a moment, comes from a William and Mary project called Eight Data, which analyzes 
about 13,500 projects worth uh, about $850 million billion across 165 countries over this 18 year period of 20, 2000 to 2017 that you see here. So in addition to those forces behind the investment shifts that I've just mentioned, there are a number of implications. Um, one is that by ratio, and this is observable in the graphs, but to put some more detail to it, we now see that China outspends the US and other major powers on a two to one basis or more. Um, it uses primarily semi-concessional and non-concessional debt rather than aid. So that's the difference that I referred to earlier between ODA and OOF. Uh, and in fact, China has maintained a 31 to one ratio of loans to grants over this period. State-owned commercial banks have begun to organize syndicates across project formulation uh, in transportation, energy, and extractive sectors primarily. Um, and this has made very vertically integrated big ticket projects possible. The, the number of mega projects financed with loans worth $500 million or more um, has tripled during the first five years of BRI implementation. So that's the period covered uh, in that graph on the right-hand side. When I say state-owned commercial banks, I want to clarify who I mean there. So traditionally, much of this lending um, and sort of strategic investment has been driven by China's so-called policy banks, that is the China Development Bank and the China Export-Import Bank. They remain central players, um, but the emergence of China's state-owned banks, like the Bank of China, China Construction Bank, for example, has grown uh, really rapidly during the BRI period, and so in the relatively recent past. Uh, and again, operates in that syndicated fashion, um, bringing largely SOE companies into the fray uh, of project formulation and execution um, so that you can get as a host country more than just finance, um, but some of the capacity gains that come alongside the presence of those operational companies. Third, um, China has seen increased levels of credit risk as a result of this growing investment portfolio. And I want to push back strongly, and I'm happy for us to discuss this further um, when I round out my initial comments, against the notion that because of China's mercantilist um, state uh, maintained and, and relatively top-down economic structure, that it does not have concerns about uh, loan defaults um, and, and project failure in its uh, external relations and its international investment. China does care about these loans giving return. While it is certainly true that many of the uh, forces and objectives behind the Belt and Road Initiative are not simply economic, but rather geopolitical and geostrategic, um, they also have the characteristic of wanting profitability. Um, that has been particularly true uh, as some degree of cooling has happened in uh, the Chinese economy. So as I referred to earlier, the chief safeguard for this growing credit risk that's happening alongside the expanding portfolio is collateralization. Um, that's become a linchpin particularly for these state-owned banks, and particularly in cases where loans are viewed as, as high risk. So in countries perceived to have large uh, potential for default, corruption problems, governance problems, political instability problems, et cetera. Um, these loans are typically collateralized against future commodity exports. In some, case, uh, in some cases also, um, the takeover of the infrastructure that is built. Uh, and uh, they have typically fairly high interest rates, nearly 6% uh, on average. The fourth characteristic of this uh, meteoric investment growth that I want to highlight um, is that we see um, this uh, really pronounced move um, from lending towards sovereign borrowers, i.e. central government institutions during the pre-Belt and Road era, um, toward lending to state-owned companies, state-owned banks, special purpose vehicles, joint ventures, private sector institutions in the destination countries. That now makes up for 70% of the investment that you see in that BRI period graph on the right-hand side. 
Um, this is relevant both for the operation of the projects, um, but also for how the debt is recorded and um, observable on the balance sheets of the low and middle income destination countries. Uh, one of the results is uh, a degree of kind of hidden debt exposure that no longer shows up on government liability uh, declarations um, and blurry distinctions between public and private debt pronouncements from those LMICs. It is estimated um, by this kind of third party analysis that 42 low and middle income countries now have debt exposure to China in excess of 10% of their own GDP. Uh, and uh, these, as I mentioned, are systemically underreported uh, to things like the World Bank's debtor reporting system uh, and other international uh, arenas. The final point that I'll make before we move on um, is to say that these uh, this BRI investment uh, spike that we see here is also plagued with a fairly large and in China's case confronting level of implementation problems. 35% roughly of BRI of the BRI infrastructure project portfolio has encountered major such problems, corruption, scandals, labor violations, environmental hazards, the um, brushing past or ignoring of uh, environmental standards and impact assessments, um, public backlash, etc. cetera. Uh, find that BRI problems, uh, excuse me, the BRI infrastructure projects are less likely to face such problems when they are un undertaken by host country organizations um, than when they are driven primarily by the Chinese investors and companies. Um, and that is something that we can speak to a bit more when looking at the evolution of China's standards for this outbound investment. Um, but before doing so, I do want to go back a little bit into understanding the domestic changes in China that have yielded this shifting uh, outbound picture. Uh, and to do so, we really have to look, one, at the uh, kind of astronomical increases in uh, GDP that China has experienced since its economic opening of the late 1970s um, and the fossil fuel uh, and industrial backbone of that growth that has uh, fueled uh, an impressive um, and accelerated picture of, uh, of, of poverty eradication, improvements of quality of life and the like. Um, been defined by double digit GDP growth, heavy investment in heavy industries, strong dependence on physical exports, high profits, low wage expenditures, and, and massive consumption growth, including shifts from China moving from being largely self sufficient in key uh, energy resources to quickly becoming the largest importers of such uh, products in the world. Um, the fallout from that has been the overcapacity problems that I mentioned previously, also fairly severe domestic environmental challenges and water, soil quality, and most uh, sort of prominently air pollution, uh, which has begun to fuel in the second part of the 2010s, uh, a structural economic transformation with a number of earmarks. Uh, one is growing investments in the renewable space, which you can see uh, in the graph on the upper left-hand side of this slide as Chinese investment comes to outstrip that in the United States and Europe. Uh, yes, a continuation of coal consumption, but a relative by Chinese standards plateauing of that consumption with uh, some anticipation of decline in the not too distant future. A complicated issue that we can get into further uh, in discussion if anyone is interested. We've seen services outstrip manufacturing during the 12 five year plan, that was from 2011 to 2015. I think kind of a symbolic shift. Um, uh, as well as a material one that demonstrates that this kind of uh, high industrial capacity, industrially export driven economy is giving way to a higher tech, more services oriented, uh, lower, ultimately um, cleaner and lower carbon situation at home. And this is both driven and reflected rhetorically, um, as you see in one of my favorite images that I uh, confess to, to showing probably too frequently, 
um, which is President Xi's uh, or, and, and his predecessors, mentions of the environment in black and economy in red in annual addresses to the party Congress, um, watching those cross over uh, as, a, as kind of a signpost for um, prioritization in the mid 2010s. <clears throat> Uh, and so we put these uh, we put these kinds of domestic and international forces together, and we see a picture of China um, beginning in the early years of the Belt and Road Initiative, defraying some of its excess coal capacity, in particular, uh, into its outbound investment. And I'll show you a few figures here. This one I recognize is a bit busy, so I'll try to just hit the highlights here. Um, which is to say that between 20, 2007 and 2015, we saw China lead all nations uh, in financing some $25 billion worth of uh, outbound coal creation, top recipients being Indo India, uh, which has since sunsetted, Indonesia, Mongolia, Vietnam, and Turkey. Uh, China has also helped build a coal sector in Pakistan, where one previously did not exist in a meaningful way locking in decades of, um, of both conventional pollution and, and carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions uh, that will be reckoned with long after these projects were formulated. Uh, Chinese companies and banks have been involved in uh, some 250 coal fire power projects in uh, 25 of the countries on the Belt and Road by the end of 2016. Five major SOEs in China are involved in roughly four fifths of these projects. And that is in contrast to an extent to the renewable sector, which has a larger presence of private sector organizations. To put it perhaps a bit more plainly, here is the composition of China's BRI energy investments. And you can see on the far left hand side the outsized role of coal. Um, in the renewable space, the outsized role of hydro uh, and the relatively low levels of investment relative to those other sources in solar and wind. It does bear mentioning that China still compares favorably in outbound investment in solar and wind to the peer uh, countries and use case regional blocks that I will describe here shortly. Uh, for a bit more of a comparative flavor uh, across a wider swath of time. Here you'll see China's overseas, oh, excuse me, overseas capacity additions facilitated through finance. That is projects that would not have taken hold without such finance from China, Japan, and the US from 2000 to 2018. Uh, the US moved off of such coal investments in 2013. So that was really uh, a temporal difference here. Um, with the U.S. Uh, being quickly outstripped by the expanding Chinese investment that I've just been discussing, you again see in China's case a really outsized role from coal there at 58 percent and beyond coal from hydro. <clears throat> So as uh, is, is probably unsurprising, um, given those trajectories, China began to face pushback, both from uh, some uh, groups, institutions, and, and countries themselves um, in host countries about its prioritization of coal investment in the energy sector um, and its wider uh, uh, approach to environmental and climate impact assessments in transportation projects and other infrastructure development initiatives in these destination countries. Um, the response has seen uh, a, a gradual um, and uh, debatably meaningful development of uh, additional principles meant to undergird BRI practices and investments. And these occur on cross ministerial levels. Um, some of them involve uh, the National Energy Agency, the National Development Reform Commission, which between them really set China's own domestic energy policy. Others include the Ministry of Ecology and Environments, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, and the Ministry of Commerce, um, who have put together green belt and road principles as well. Uh, some environmental cooperation plans spearheaded by the MEE, and guiding principles on finance, green investment principles that bring together a lot of non-state 
uh, actors, including major players from the financial sector, not only those Chinese SOE and policy banks, but also international financial institutions, including those from the West. These have been justifiably criticized as lacking teeth and import. And it is true that China's uh, overarching guiding principle in its foreign international infrastructure investment um, has been to try uh, to meet the standards of the host country itself um, and the uh, push for China to have more uniform, high quality environmental and climate standards for its outbound investment has not been operationalized meaningfully to date, um, although there is some sign that that could be gradually evolving. So one thing that's less deniable and less debatable, and I, I am beginning to, to round out the China section before we'll conclude uh, by looking at the, the US and EU in particular, is that an annual energy finance from the policy banks has been declining. Now, this is not divided by fuels, um, but it shows kind of an overarching decline, which also mirrors larger decline in BRI investment more broadly. So this is kind of an updated vision from that first slide that I showed you on China's growth, moving it into an outsized place in the international economy. Uh, some of this is no doubt pandemic related um, and related to various economic forces. Um, but it certainly bears mentioning when trying to assess the future climate implications of China's outbound investment. Um, to seek to uh, contextualize that further with an comparisons uh, from China's uh, the other peer major financiers in this space, um, we see an overall decline um, from the other major uh, funders, um, Japan, South Korea, historically, um, previous to that, Germany for a number of years in the, uh, in the overall coal investment from 2013 to 2018. Uh, previous to China making its UNGA declaration last week, Korea and Japan both foreswore such investment, uh, leaving it on something of an island, as it also faced pressure from the US presidential envoy John Kerry on climate change to make such a declaration uh, and also from European, and G European Union and G7 leaders. As for the composition of, um, sorry. As for the composition of that investment, you see declines uh, largely across the board and, um, in particular here uh, for the, um, the non-coal uh, sectors, uh, that top green bar is, uh, is non-hydro renewables. Um, and ultimately now with this announcement, we will see that coal investment ultimately trickle out. Um, but the overarching energy investment trends outbound from China are clear. <clears throat> This all comes at the same time that the U.S. is seeking uh, more overtly than in the past and really from the first days and, and the planning documents uh, for the transition from the Biden administration uh, to actively counter BRI investment, investment through its own um, initiatives, which seek to offer alternatives to these LMICs uh, for infrastructure development that will have different characteristics. Uh, the two that I highlight here are the Blue Dot Network, announced in November of 2019 in partnership with Australia and Japan, which is a multi-stakeholder initiative to bring together governments and private sector and civil society to promote high quality and trusted standards for sustainable and principles-based global infrastructure development. Very, very uh, important language that's also reflected in the even more ambitious Build Back Better World initiative developed under the Biden administration's leadership at the G7 which seeks values-driven high standard and transportation infrastructure partnerships led by major democracies to help narrow the 40 plus trillion dollar infrastructure need in the developing world, a number that I think belies all comprehension um, and which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, similarly to the Blue Dot Network, this seeks to be values-driven based on good governance, strong standards, climate-friendly, strong strategic partnerships, mobilizing private capital through development finance. That is development finance coming in and defraying risk so that private capital can come on its heels. 
and enhancing the impact of multilateral development finance, uh, which I have no idea what means even having read this uh, from, from their perspective. Um, it seems a little bit like development finance gobbledygook to me. The EU similarly, and this is almost in real time, has just announced um, the Global Gateway Initiative. And I think that some of the pronouncements here are interesting for their overt targeting of China as a strategic rival in the international infrastructure development space, particularly as it relates to climate change, social justice, um, economic vitality, and the like. Uh, the European Commission president in the State of the Union address last week said that we will build global gateway partnerships with countries around the world. We want investments, uh, we want investments uh, in quality infrastructure, connecting goods, peoples, and services around the world, and a values-based approach. We want to create links and not dependencies, implicitly calling out China for the sorts of uh, debt arrangements and condition uh, and and uh, and uh, leveraging of natural resource uh, exports that I mentioned earlier in my talk. Well, we are good at financing roads, um, President Ursula, Ursula von der Leyen said, but it does not make sense for Europe to build a perfect road between a Chinese-owned copper mine and a Chinese-owned harbor. It's typically are laid between the lines a bit more than the president did last week. Again, I think, interestingly, um, we have to get smarter when it comes to this kind of investment. Um, which, which really will lead me into my concluding thoughts on the level of competitiveness that these new uh, approaches from the West will have. Um, but before wrapping up with those final thoughts and questions, I do think it's important to highlight uh, the, this, the climate stakes in as, uh, as basic and real terms as I can here with just a moment. On the left here, we see a figure from the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, um, which is building out the scientific basis for different emissions scenarios. Our current commitments and trajectory likely see us on that mid-level emissions line uh, that you see exceeds 2.5 degree temperature increase by the end of this century. On the right-hand side, you see a figure by Climate Action Tracker. With the trajectory of historical emissions being the black line, the pledges and targets currently in place under the Paris Agreement in the blue shaded band at the top, and the sort of precipitous drop we will have to see to be Paris uh, compatible with the 1.5 degree temperature target by the end of the century, a truly yeoman's task. Now, I highlight that in this context to say that when we look at the forces beneath that, uh, our ability collectively across the world to meet those sorts of targets and avoid the worst uh, results from climate change, certainly we see domestic action in large emitters like China, the United States, the European Union, and to a slightly lesser degree, countries like China, uh, Japan uh, and Germany. Um, but we also see a, a real inflection point on the energy and infrastructure trajectories of countries that need vastly improved access to power, services, transportation, and the like, uh, vastly improved access to public health uh, and to education and to the other things which infrastructure is in instrumental in providing, uh, and uh, countries in this category having, as a result, enormously high emissions growth potential. And so the systems that are ultimately deployed to meet those needs um, will be instrumental in whether or not we find ourselves on that high temperature trajectory, or in fact, are able to keep our uh, already baked in temperature increases to a more acceptable level. Um, and when we consider the outsized influence and presence of a relatively small number of players, China, the EU, and the United States chief among them, Japan and Korea not uh, terribly far behind in uh, the next tier, um, it becomes uh, it really apparent how much the outbound investment decisions and practices of these groups will have a bearing on those climate change outcomes. Um, so uh, I'll just conclude with a few uh, points and a few questions uh, or a few continuing uncertainties. 
The first is that China's move away from coal investment is highly significant in its own right. And I think that that's borne out by seeing where it was only a few years ago and where it will soon be now. Whether the fundamentals of Chinese overseas investment are shifting is more difficult to parse. Um, and it's important to note that the BRI has been popular in part because of uh, what it is, not because of what it's not. It's been met by uh, support for many leaders in LMICs precisely because of its ability to align with local political interests, its ability to be flexible on standards and practices as opposed to rigid and uniform across different contexts, its adaptability as a result of that, um, and its interconnected and vertically integrated model that I referred to earlier with the syndicate approaches that can bring uh, government authorities, ministerial figures, financiers, engineers, builders, labor forces, et cetera, all to bear on projects relatively quickly. Nascent US and EU-led initiatives are, are taking a, a profoundly different approach and are really doubling down on standards-driven investment um, with the hope that they uh, can show some comparative advantage uh, in quality, in uh, environmental and social outcomes, in loan conditionality, um, and in geopolitical alignments. Uh, I think that these uh, these uh, the prospects for these approaches to compete with China's outbound investment will depend on the degree to which they can uh, retain those characteristics while also improving their nimbleness, uh, communicating an attractiveness that wins the, the public argument and the, the private arguments in powerful stakeholders and destination countries, the future of Chinese project performances, and ultimately the geopolitical maneuvering uh, of all of these major players and how they're perceived in the host countries themselves. So sorry for predictably going a bit over my time. Um, thank you again and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Jackson. This was a wonderful uh, overview of uh, a very important, of course, uh, uh, issue, but also, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a very dynamic situation. It has been, of course, for a while and it will be for a long time. Uh, and uh, there are several questions from the audience, but just before I uh, uh, switch to some of the uh, questions through the chat, I want to ask you, because you already, of course, uh, talked extensively about China and then eventually the US, Europe, Korea, and you mentioned uh, Japan too. Uh, but what about uh, the international organizations? Which are, who are the main players? And uh, we have a WTO for trade, but what about for infrastructure? Because who is going to, at the end, uh, be a final um, judge, if you want, on uh, some of these uh, infrastructure investments in infrastructure? It's a great point, and it's a it's a kind of unforgivable omission, I think, for me to have just given that presentation and not mention any of the Bretton Woods space financial institutions, which are certainly relevant to this conversation. Um, I will say there is a, a fairly profoundly uh, a fairly pronounced difference in scale in the outbound investment from groups like the World Bank, the IMF and um, even uh, regional, and on also, I should say, regional counterparts like the Asia Development Bank, Asia International Infrastructure Bank, the former being based in Philippines, but largely Jap Japan-led, the latter um, being based in China and largely China-led, while both being international in character. Um, at these, the, the, just the, the volumes of financing outbound from these organizations pale in comparison to that which we see outbound from China's policy and development banks and from, um, to a, a lesser extent, given the overall volumes, um, to some of the, the lending that we see from major sovereign countries. Um, but it's still not insignificant. And the place where I think that it has its uh, greatest influence on the conversation that I've tried to initiate here is on standards development. Um, so when we look to these statements from the EU and US uh, about standards and values-driven approaches to finance, part of what they are implicitly referring to 
are the standards and practices that have been developed not only by their own development finance and aid institutions, the DFC and, uh, and USAID in the US, for example, but also from the World Bank, from the IMF, um, et cetera, which have enormously detailed methodologies for project evaluation. Um, now, these are not always perfect, and it's not to say that, uh, that problems do not arise in these projects. They certainly do. Um, um, and by problems, I, I don't just mean bureaucratic inefficiencies. I mean the problems that we hear Chinese projects criticized for on corruption, governance, et cetera. Um, these these uh, institutions aren't immune from that, but certainly have put more um, detailed and pronounced safeguards in place. And so the um, pronouncements from the major Western financiers are coming kind of on the on the uh, the foundation of some of that DFC work. I don't see an adjudicator here, similar to the WTO. Um, uh, I think that this will continue to be uh, a competitive and malleable arena. Thank you. And uh, so I just uh, go over some of the questions to the chat. Uh, the first question is from Sam Willen. Is that he asks, can you talk about the allegations of China using slave labor to produce solar panels and other things that they export? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, the accusations referred to here um, are primarily in the Western regions of China with large populations of ethnic Uyghurs um, who have come under substantial uh, persecution um, from the central Chinese government, uh, you know, government uh, authorities and, and, and practices and approaches to managing the Xinjiang region. Um, and that has led to accusations of uh, the production of solar panels and other products in Xinjiang coming on the heels of certainly unjust and, and uh, labor practices, um, including accusations of slave labor. Uh, and this has led to some calls for boycotting the, those products and even materials, um, not finalized products that are exported out of the Xinjiang region um, or that have um, some of the product supply chain exists there. Um, and I think that the, the um, potential ripple effects for um, solar deployment are, are substantial. And you know, if such large barriers are put in place to the importation of those products, then you could see that result in an uptick of uh, production of solar panels and other products that have, um, have that element in their supply chain from other countries. Um, so you could see a domestic uptick in production here in the United States or elsewhere. I know your question, though, speaks to the more important social justice issues at play there uh, embedded in those accusations, which is more important than the price of our solar panels. Um, I'm simply not the person to answer that, though. Uh, so I apologize. I, I won't try to, I, I will quickly overstep my uh, capacities to discuss the Xinjiang and Uyghur problem in, uh, in detail. Uh, thank you, Jackson. And uh, there is a question from Bobby Compton, and this is uh, particularly relevant thinking about the Evergrande uh, situation in China. How does the current China decision on bifurcation of Evergrande capital structure payouts to China domestic bondholders versus foreign bondholders affect the foreign capital credit spreads in BRI projects going forward? Do BRI projects have bifurcated credit holders between domestic and foreign? If so, what might be spread difference going forward? Yeah, that's a great detailed question. I, again, um, I don't claim to, um, to have substantial expertise on the Evergrande um, issue in its own right, but I think I can say a couple of things that are germane to that question. Um, one, the, the, you know, the, the first answer, or excuse me, the answer to your question on um, will this uh, sort of issue set affect foreign capital credit spreads and BRI projects going forward? Uh, I think it's already uh, beginning to affect the outlays that are steered towards um, China's international investments in the BRI broadly. Um, and that is, uh, that is tied both to the um, kind of uh, 
uh, spooking of China's domestic markets as a result of Evergrande, um, but also um, the uh, potential for other sectors in China to similarly have uh, those kinds of debt repayment crises, uh, including in the energy sector, which has been largely subsidizing uh, um, through uneconomic deals many of the traditional uh, power generators and uh, utilities and distributors um, in the, the Chinese system in combination with the, the curtailment of energy production for environmental reasons uh, in the long term for strategic purposes. And again, I'm speaking in, domestic, you know, in China domestically. In the short term, though, for cleaning up uh, the environment for things like the upcoming Olympics, um, you know, other kind of proximate reasons to try to, to make some substantial changes there. Uh, all of that is, uh, is likely going to impact the, the flows and characteristics of outbound investment. Do BRA projects have bifurcated credit holders between domestic and foreign? Yes. Um, and in fact, this is something that I didn't mention um, in the opening uh, slides, which I probably should have. That percentage has been growing. Um, so there are more shared um, credit arrangements between um, host country uh, institutions. There are also um, kinds of uh, uh, strategic partnerships that are built ground up, greenfield partnerships built ground up in these host countries with Chinese financing to become the strategic partner of the future. And there are, particularly with investment from the Asian International Infrastructure Bank, uh, financial arrangements that don't just uh, have these kinds of host country and China uh, capital inputs, but also have inputs from other developmental financial institutions, from the World Bank, uh, for example, and even from other sovereign lenders. So you do see more um, of that blend occurring. Thank you. And uh, there is a question from Shishi Wu uh, that has to do with the nuclear reactor building, a uh, build. In the context of nuclear reactor build, East Asian countries such as China, Korea, and Japan, as well as the UAEs, all have significant lower capital cost for when compared to Europe, France, Finland, the UK, and US. And many of the findings are that the former group of countries are more effective in building large scale projects. Do you see this trend carrying out in investment, investments funded by these respective countries in the developing world, as well as in terms of total capital cost uh, of KW? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. I, I'm going to try to um, divide those countries up a little bit because I think that there are some real differences there. Um, for one, a kind of sneaky part of the figure, one of the figures that I showed, and some have asked if I can share the slides. I'm certainly happy to. Um, on U.S. outbound investment, is that you've seen that even when U.S. Um, nuclear investment was kind of more abundant, static at home in the post 1970s era after our major build here, um, it was a major portion of US outbound investment, much of which was in R&D um, and, and you know, kind of basic um, onboarding of nuclear capabilities. Um, that I, I, I think is, has waned, but is important to, to note from, from the past. Uh, China, certainly, you know, I, I think that the on, I, I agree with your, um, with your, your premise here on uh, effectiveness in building large-scale projects in many contexts, not just nuclear, um, but China's nuclear sector has been, been growing apace um, and has taken a, a quite a different approach to that in the U.S., um, even to that in France, which has the largest share of nuclear in its energy mix of any country, um, in terms of building a number of nuclear facilities with very similar characteristics instead of bespoke nuclear facilities that come from different tendering processes domestically. Um, and this has had a number of advantages for scale and for the time horizons at which they can be onboarded. Now, whether this becomes a major investment destination, I, I, you know, I hesitate to speculate. Um, you could argue that with Japan's um, curtailment of nuclear development at home. Um, and there's still debate about what role nuclear will play in the country. Um, I would suspect it will likely um, fall in the continuation of the 20-ish percentile range of uh, Japan's overall energy mix. 
um, and not go to the zero being called for by the anti-nuclear lobby there, um, but also not expand to the 75 and 80% nuclear goals that existed before the Fukushima nuclear disaster in 2011. Uh, very important for understanding Japan's energy mix is to understand how much that derailed what was going to become a growing dependence on nuclear within the country. Now, whether that leads to that same kind of excess capacity and knowledge, let's go outbound with this um, because we can't really build at home. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about it uh, to speculate on, on that. Um, but I, you know, on a, on a personal level, um, I think in certain countries with certain characteristics, nuclear um, makes sense as a source of baseline power. I find the criticisms of embedded lifespan emissions um, and proliferation and accident risks um, to be um, insufficient uh, as arguments for moving away from nuclear uh, in contexts where uh, renewables alone um, and perhaps gas is in the fossil fuel space uh, will, will be enough um, to, to meet that energy and electricity uh, and industrialization demand. Um, so I frankly hope that we see some investment in uh, proliferation safe, next generation, highly efficient nuclear in contexts where it makes sense. And I think these countries are well positioned to drive some of that, whether that happens or not, um, you'll have to find someone smarter than me. <clears throat> that would be difficult. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I have a, since um, I know we are getting close to the end of this uh, uh, um, event, I want to ask you uh, what about the uh, COP26 uh, in Glasgow? Because this is going, uh, certainly what you present is going to be part uh, of the discussion, in particular, the relationship between uh, investment infrastructures and uh, climate change. So what do you think is going to dominate the agenda and, uh, and uh, what is your uh, thought about you know, attending the, the meeting? Thank you, G Giovanni. We, we spoke a tiny bit about this before the session and I did mention I'll, I'll be attending um, the meetings this, this year as per usual. Um, and uh, so I hope to be able to have a better answer on the heels of that. On one level, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which holds these annual conference of parties, which is the primary United Nations summit uh, that is comprehensive and includes all countries of the world to negotiate out the primary uh, international frameworks that seek to guide and govern our collective efforts to address climate change. The most famous current treaty guiding those efforts is the Paris Agreement. Uh, is particularly ill-equipped to deal with this issue of international investment. And for that matter, it's ill-equipped to deal with, with, with climate-relevant pieces of international trade. Um, the primary reason for that is the accounting structure of the UNFCCC and the ways in which it calls on countries to make their climate change goals and targets. Um, and that is to say that those approaches are, are quite domestic in nature. Um, you know, one could argue not completely domestic, uh, but lar certainly largely domestic. So you uh, are compelled through the Paris Agreement to, as a country, come forward with goals for what you seek to achieve, both in terms of mitigating climate change and adapting to climate changes that come. Um, and these so-called nationally determined contributions to the global effort to address climate change are quite unique to different countries and have very, very different characteristics in both in their content and in their breadth and in their ambition. Um, but unifying that is that they are, again, largely domestic. So my, my call, my, my NDC is going to commit me to, uh, as I mentioned for China earlier, peaking climate change or peaking carbon emissions before 2030, reaching carbon neutrality by 2060. Um, other countries will agree to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by certain percentages relative to certain baseline years, again, often moving to neutrality by mid-century. They're only talking about their domestic operations. That does not cover any of the emissions embedded in the products that we import. That does not cover any of the emissions, emissions embedded in the projects that we finance and operationalize internationally. So the system is, in that sense, not very well set up for adjudicating some of these uh, international infrastructure trends uh, 
um, or compelling countries that are driving them, like China, like the US, like the EU countries, um, to, to change that behavior. I think other forums are more uh, effective and appropriate in some ways for, for dealing with that. And those include some that we've already talked about. Giovanni, your reference to the WTO uh, brings to mind the potential of more climate change consideration in international trade agreements. Um, in both, both as they are, are kind of managed or adjudicated by the WTO, but also through regional trade agreements, where we do see some signs um, of, of climate consciousness embedded within that. Um, there's also certainly a presence in the lar or excuse me, in the kind of instrumental geopolitical forums like the G7 and like the G20, um, where some standards and practices on outbound investment could be possible and have been part of the conversation before. At the UNFCCC level, there are discussions on, on responsible investment practices, et cetera, but they don't really take center stage in the same way. Um, though the one place I would say um, that there could be some convergence between the COP process and these sorts of international investment and trade issues is on environmental markets um, and the intersection of environmental markets with uh, the growth of of border carbon adjustment measures. Um, the most tangible proposal, uh, which will take shape later this decade, is from the EU, which has announced uh, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM, which essentially in certain products will require a, a country that seeks to export to the European market to pay a tariff that covers the carbon content of that product if they do not already have in place a carbon pricing mechanism that is commensurate with, with that that um, that takes that that exists in the EU. So essentially, it's trying to levelize that playing field. It's trying to protect domestic European industries from having to compete against uh, competitors internationally that face less onerous um, carbon uh, and greenhouse gas pollution regulations. Um, and that takes place largely through those sorts of market-based systems. That does relate to the COP because the last mate, one of the last major agenda items for Glasgow um, here at the beginning of November will be continuing to finalize the rule book for Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which does manage and create rules and, uh, and frameworks for practices for the exchange of emissions reductions in international markets, carbon markets, emissions trading systems, offset markets, et cetera, internationally. Um, and that's a, a, that's a topic for another day, um, but I do think it's a point for convergence into this world of international trade and investment where um, keen observers should, should look for outcomes from COP26. Thank you, Jackson. Thank you really for taking the time to speak with us. And uh, definitely we will uh, reconnect after Glasgow because I think it's going to be interesting to hear from you um, what happened and how it went and your uh, thoughts on, on, the, on the meeting. And definitely uh, your last point, since we are particularly interested in diplomacy, uh, diplomacy in action in uh, all these um, different uh, areas is of great importance to avoid uh, what we have been experiencing with trade in some, uh, in some in different instances. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you to all the attendees. We will send a uh, record uh, the video of this um, event uh, with uh, the uh, slides. And uh, so you will receive in a couple of days uh, the material that uh, you may want to. Uh, send. I know some of you asked for slides, so they are going to be in the video, but we can also provide them separately uh, when we send this uh, video and an article and the slide. So Jackson, thank you very much. And for uh, just, I want just to say that next week, Wednesday at the center will continue. We will have a, a, another uh, very interesting event. The title is World Town Forever, Resisting Displacement Through Multiracial Intergenerational Organizing. And the main uh, speaker will be a Duke alumnus, Brando Williams, who is uh, a community builder. So hopefully you will join that event as well. Jackson, thank you very much again. And thank you to the team at the John Hall Franklin Center that uh, made this event possible. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.